welcome and we'll give it a moment for everyone to roll in. Hopefully it's not too hot where you are, um, but feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself and tell us where you're at. We'll get going in just a moment. From Grove, Temecula, Seaside, San Mateo, Grass Valley. We've got people from all over. Chico, Campbell, Lakeside, Bakersfield, West LA. Good. It's nice to see people from all over the state and all these different areas, up in Eureka, down in El Cajon, Burbank, Richmond, Lakewood. Uh, it's nice to see people rolling in from all over. Well, as a little bit of housekeeping as we're all getting up and rolling here, um, Feel free throughout to use the chat to talk to each other. And there is a lot of knowledge in these rooms usually. Uh, use the Q&A to ask questions. And if we have time at the end, we'll try to get to some of those. And feel free to, you know, to get asked those questions as well in the chat because somebody there may know those answers already. We won't be doing it taking hands because with a group of a few hundred people, it's just too chaotic to open up the floor and have different people speaking. Um, ready to get going? All right. Well, this is our gardening FAQs, the things that Maya and I get asked all the time and a few extra ones. So I'm Anne-Marie Benz. I'm the CMPS Horticulture Programs Manager. And I get to spend my day thinking about, talking about, advocating for native plants. Uh, Maya? Yeah, uh, my name is Maya Argamon, and I am the CNPS uh, Senior Program Coordinator um, for the horticulture team. So yeah, I'm really excited to dive into talking about all the general questions and more specific questions that you all have about gardening. Um, yeah, thank all you. Right. We're, we're gonna get going. Um... So we're gonna just start kind of broad, um, going into the benefits of using California native plants in your garden. Um, so there's a lot of really great reasons why to choose uh, California native plants for your garden. Um, some include water efficiency, you know, because if you choose um, native plants that are actually locally adapted to your area. Um, they're adapted to your specific region's climate and rainfall patterns um, and can help reduce long-term outdoor water use over time um, because they're, you know, they've adapted to our climate. You know, they don't really, once they're established, a lot of native plants don't require any additional watering past establishment. Um, and for native plants also, they require less maintenance. Um, if they're chosen um, in the right area and planted well, um, they're, you know, they'll really thrive um, where they're planted and they'll require just minimal maintenance, um, pruning if you want, and um, yeah, pretty low, low maintenance. Um, and native plants provide essential habitat and sources of food for our wildlife, birds, butterflies, bees, and other pollinators. Um, there are some native plants that have co-evolved with specific pollinators. Um, so they rely on each other for survival. Um, and above, I mean, as, as, as well as all of these things, um, native plants also provide a sense of place that's unique to California. I think it's really special to grow plants that are, you know, specifically adapted to your specific area and provide that sense of place that's so unique and what makes California so beautiful and special. So um, those are some of the general benefits to growing California native plants in your garden. So 
So next slide. Oh yeah, thank you. So how do I choose the right California native plant for your specific location? Um, later on, we'll do a demo for Calscape, but what's really important um, is to understand your site conditions. This is a photo I took of a beautiful native plant garden um, down in Oceanside in, in San Diego. Um, and you can see that there's a lot going on in the site. There's um, like on the left side, there's a lot of shade and then they have like a fun water feature. Um, and then on the right side up against the, um, the wall, you know, it gets more sun. Um, so it's really important to think about your site conditions and um, in terms of sun exposure and, you know, really observing how sun moves throughout your space throughout the day and knowing that that changes dependent on the season. And if you have a tree that you just planted um, and at a certain time in a few years down the road, that area that was once full sun is now part shade. Um, and understanding your soil conditions. Um, I think that's a question that we have later on, but um, knowing what kind of soil you have is really important. So you choose plants that match the soil and there's always a native plant that works for the kind of soil that you have. It's just a matter of understanding and identifying the kind of soil you have and finding a plant that works for that. Um, and watering needs are important. Um, knowing you know, how much, um, if you have specific plants um, already in your garden and knowing you know the watering needs that they have already. So choosing plants that match that. And if you're starting from scratch, um, you know, making sure that you're choosing and grouping plants with similar watering needs together. Um, that's a term called hydrozoning. So that's an important aspect as well. Um, and last but not least, understanding your climate, um, specifically your microclimate, which is, you know, different, um, <clears throat> like in your, in your garden, um, in your site, there's certain areas that can have different, um, different climates. Like for example, I'm in uh, the Western part of San Francisco. Um, so um, I'm really exposed to a lot of fog and salt and wind. So one side of my garden is more wind protected than the other side. So kind of understanding the different microclimates and um, choosing plants accordingly. So that's just a general overview on choosing your, um, choosing the right plant for your area. What's the best thing you can put on your garden, Maya? Your shadow. <laughs> <laughs> Maya tells me this all the time. <laughs> so just, yeah, spending time in your garden and it's always an experiment too and um, kind of figuring out what works and what doesn't. There's no- Especially if you have small rule. microclimates. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so the next question is, um, what are some key factors to consider when designing a California native plant garden? Um, again, this is going to be kind of a broad overview, but like I said, really, really understanding your site conditions. So your sun exposure, the kind of soil you have, the watering needs that you have, um, and your specific microclimate or climate in your area um, is really important. And also with watering needs, um, just going to touch on that a little bit more. Um, being sure to think about, you know, in terms of convenience and watering, if you don't have like already an established irrigation, irrigation system, um, you know, generally um, you want to water, um, you want to have the plants that are further away from your house um, or your space, um, like with the least water, we least watering needed. So, um, there's like the oasis zone, which is around 30 to 50 feet around your house or your your building, and that's where you want more intensive watering. Um, and then the further away you go, the, the less watering you want to have to do. Um, so that's something about, you know, also factoring to factors to consider. Um, and just like if you want, you know, I mean, just general gardening, you know, your edible, edible plants or your, you know, herbal plants. Um, you know, maybe you want closer to your kitchen or your dining area, easy access, um, things like that. Um, so yeah, understanding your site conditions is really important. Um, and knowing what the purpose of your garden is, you know, if you want like a, if you want like curb appeal and lots of color and, you know, lots of, you know, variety of textures and foliage and color, um, maybe that's a purpose, you know, that's what you really want to focus on. Or if you want really just like habitat value and you really want to have plants that, you know, something that blooms at least 
like once every year or like something that's blooming throughout the year um, in your garden. Or if you want, you know, maybe something more calming or uh, maybe a just like naturalistic look, if you want like something that's like big swaths of the same species all altogether. Um, that's also a, a fun design um, aspect to play with. Um, so, or if you want like a space that's, you know, for entertaining or if you have kids that you want to still have, you know, running around or pets, you know, so just really understanding the purpose of your garden too is important. Um, and um, last but not least, um, planting and plant communities, if you have the space for it is um, a really great factor to consider. Um, you know, it's makes a lot of sense in terms of how you want to group plants together. Um, so if you plant by plant community um, or plant, like by habitat type, then um, you're hitting all the bases where you're choosing plants that naturally grow together in the wild. And so therefore will, you know, thrive together in a garden setting. Um, and they still provide um, essential habitat um, and they look really beautiful together. Um, so Definitely planting by plant community um, is a big um, suggestion when you're designing a native plant garden. It just functionally and aesthetically makes a lot of sense. Um, next slide, please. Um, so key factors to consider um, when creating a habitat friendly garden. Um, yeah, so like I said, with planting by plant community, um, it's great to choose locally appropriate native plants. So um, plants that, you know, actually are adapted to your specific area. For example, you know, like um, up here, like, or let's see, you want to plant, I'm trying to think, like a Matilia poppy, you know, they're technically native in California, but they're not native to San Francisco. So um, choosing plants that are actually um, locally native to your area is a really good first step in creating habitat friendly gardens. Um, and you can do that by going onto calscape.org and filling in your, your address or your zip code, and then um, it'll generate plants that are locally appropriate to your area. Um, and another thing to note is, you know, making sure you're choosing plants that bloom at different seasons. And there's definitely native plants that bloom, um, at all different times of year. Um, you know, in the winter you can be having, um, manzanitas or ribes or currants, which are great, um, winter blooming plants. Um, in the summer there's California fuchsia. I mean, that's what's blooming in my backyard right now. Um, in the spring, there's a plethora of plants too. Um, so on Calscape as well, you can see the bloom time um, for, for the plants as well on the plant profile. So it's a cool feature. Um, and it's important to leave bare soil for ground dwelling bees. Um, mulching native plants, or not the plants themselves, mulching around native plants in gardens is great. Um, you know, it retains soil moisture and represses weeds, um, but it's important to leave a little bit of bare ground for the ground dwelling bees. Um, and on calscape.org, you can see what kind of wildlife and pollinators are dependent on each um, specific plant species too. So it is, that's a cool feature to check out as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, and bloom, bloom time can totally vary depending on where you are and also like how you're watering too. Um, and if you're pruning or like deadheading um, certain plants, then, you know, that'll prolong the bloom time as well. So everything is, you know, it really depends on where you are and how you're maintaining your plants. But um, I just saw that pop up on the chat. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so how to incorporate California native plants into your existing garden. This is also another beautiful garden in San Diego. Um, but yeah, we get this question a lot. Um, so it's important to um, choose the right plant for your specific size at maturity. Um, 
native plants, I think it's like the saying is like the first year sleep, the next year creep and the third year leap. So that's like, it takes three years or so really like depends on the plant and the location and all that, but three years for it to really like fill in a space and reach maturity. Um, so making sure that you're accounting for the size of the plant at maturity when planting is important. You don't want it to overcrowd the existing plants that are there. Um, and choosing a plant that meets the current watering needs of um, the surrounding area and the site that you have. Um, and, you know, being mindful that you might have to water that specific plant more at first um, so it can survive the first uh, it's first dry summer um, through establishment. So just taking, just being um, mindful of that. Um, so those are just some things to consider when you're incorporating a native plant into um, an existing garden. Yeah. Um, and when is the best time to plant California native plants and what are some planting techniques? Um, so the best time would be right about now. I mean, not this very moment. I mean, in, at least in the Bay Area, there's a extreme heat wave, so would not suggest planting this weekend. Um, but generally late fall to like through winter is great time to plant California native plants, especially in the fall, because um, it's great to have um, them in the ground before and during winter rain so they can establish their root system and be able to survive their first dry summer. Um, so really utilize this time to plan and go to your local nursery or your chapter plant sale and, and um, choose um, you know the right plants for you and then plant them you know before it gets dry again. So definitely now is the time. Um, and so some quick um, planting techniques, like I said, when um, you're choosing a plant in an existing garden, making sure that you're spacing the plants far enough apart to account for their size at maturity is really important. Um, I definitely have this problem of getting too excited and thinking I can cram in another plant and then a year down the road, it's just a mess and I have to prune it back and, or like relocate the plant. So it's just a, better just to start with, um, having them spaced out appropriately at first. Um, and when planting a native plant, um, dig a hole that is twice as wide and half as deep as the container that it's in. Um, and if you're planting on a slope, it's best to create a flat area around the hole too. Um, it'll help the plant retain a little bit more water if it's on a slope. Um, and make sure to pre-irrigate. Um, so that means like watering the hole and let it soak through at least once um, before planting. Um, and when you're actually physically planting the plant, uh, make sure that you're really mindful of the root ball and I don't have a, I wish I had a plant with me in a pot, but um, be sure to really not, don't like pull from the stem or crown of the plant, just kind of rough around the actual container and just gently get the plant out of there. Um, and hopefully it'll be pretty easy to do so um, if the plant is like been in the pot for a really long time and it's really difficult to get out then just try to be mindful of that. Um, and make sure when you have the plant in um, in its hole that you have around one inch above, um, the like the root ball is one inch above the surrounding area. Um, and I have a link to a video I'll put in the chat that is a quick demo on, on what I'm talking about because it's much easier to see it visually and then you just talking about it. Um, but I'll put that in the chat so you can all use that as a reference. Um, and oh, also another tip is just to do, it's best to do planting in the early morning or when it's like foggy or cloudy out. Um, um, just so it's, the plant is gonna be in shock going to this new home. So it's great to just minimize the amount of exposure to sun and all of that um, when planting. Um, 
And with seeds too, we had a webinar about sowing seeds um, in the past. I think it's on the YouTube channel too. And that goes over, I talk about how to sow um, native seeds as well. And yeah, it's also same timing. Like I typically sow seeds um, more in the winter, like in December, January, um, but really depends on where you are too. So check that out. Um, I'll put that in the link too, if you want more specifics on sowing seeds. Um, okay, so tips and tricks for watering native plants. Um, and there's, like I keep saying, there's a lot of variability dependent on um, where you're located and the kind of plants that you have. Um, this is a good picture, but it's not great because it looks like it was in the middle of the day. Um, so you really want to water kind of similar to when you're planting in the early morning is ideal um, before the sun is really on the plants um, or in the evening that works as well but early morning is ideal um yeah um and this really minimizes um evaporation so it's just like better water efficiency um and it yeah conserves water and prevents uh fungal disease because sometimes if you water at night like the just like the, the it's just the moisture in the roots isn't great um and <clears throat> Also, like what I did for before this heat wave in San Francisco is I watered a few, like over the past few days I watered. I mean, I usually don't water any of my native plants anymore, but um, yeah, like I watered before leading up to the heat wave. So if you know there's a, if there's a heat wave coming, you know, prep the plants a bit and water them before. Um, and on the flip side, if it's you know, it's going to be raining, be sure to turn off your irrigation system so you're not overwatering um, and saving water. Um, and I think the next slide has a general, very general um, timeline of watering intervals um, and, you know, when the, gen it's very, like I said, very general on um, typical timing. And it really depends on the plant that you have and when you planted it um, and <clears throat> where you're located as well. Um, but generally early morning is the ideal. It's a nice way to start the day. Just grab your cup of coffee and check out on the plants. And yeah, there's also a ton of different ways to water. You know, um, I know I'm talking more so hand watering, but you know, if you set up your um, irrigation system to water in the early morning, that's perfect. And, and drip, Drip irrigation is great too. So um, any irrigation works with native plants. You just have to, like I said, it's just like all an experiment. So just being sure to be mindful and observant of, you know, knowing how what your watering schedule is and then observing how your plants react to it and adjusting accordingly is really important. So just spending time and putting your shadow in your garden is great. Um, next slide. Yeah. So I'm going to go into pruning a little bit. Um, so generally the best time to prune is between flowering and new plant growth. Um, and every native plant is different, but generally, um, it's in the winter. So between the time, like after it's done flowering and before there's new plant growth is the ideal time to prune. Um, and generally native plants don't need to pr be pruned, but they can help improve the health and appearance of them in the garden. Like I said, I'm guilty of really over planting my garden and then I have to prune uh, plants back. So that's like really the only time that I prune um, um, and like deadheading um, certain plants a bit too. But um, before pruning, you know, you can really take the time to be mindful and think to yourself, does this plant really need it? Um, and always use the right tool for the kind of pruning that you want it to do and make sure that your tools are sharp and sterilized. Um, so to sterilize, the general, general rule of thumb is nine parts of water per one part of bleach um, in a bucket or spray bottle. And when you're done pruning, be sure to clean all your tool, tools and store in a dry place. I know this photo looks like it's really rusty pruner, so not the not the best example of <laughs> keeping them sharp, but 
yeah, ideally, uh, yeah, definitely sharp and sterilized tools um, is important. Um, and when you're pruning um, stems, be sure to cut as close to the branch or trunk as possible. Um, and be sure to not prune more than 20% of the live foliage, like the live parts of the plant at a time. That's the general rule of thumb, 20%. Um, um, and yeah, really be sure to prune between flowering and new plant growth. Um, but it depends, like if you're um, pruning, um, I mean, for example, this sage, the salvia, if you wanna prune the, you know, the deadhead, the spent flowers, then yeah, you can totally, there's no hard and fast rule about it, but also leaving, leaving some seed heads for birds um, and other wildlife is important as well. And that goes with berries too, and all of that. Um, And on Calscape, you can also search for the specific plant. Um, um, and usually they have some maintenance tips as well. And yeah, every plant is different. So it's really important to just do, uh, do some research before you prune um, because there's no, like I said, there's no hard and fast rule with any of this. Not every, everything I'm saying applies to every single native plant. There's always an exception or things that, you know, don't apply. So that's it for pruning. And I think this is on, this is all, you know. Well, on the pruning and on many of these topics, if you look at our CNPS YouTube page, we have deeper dives into some of these topics. Also, if there's something really particular you want to know, and there was a good one on pruning not too long ago. And somebody pointed that out in the chat. And I'm really enjoying watching the chat as everybody's giving each other advice and direction because there is so much to know. So what about soil? Um, I'm a huge soil nerd. I think that it is really hard to have a successful anything without really good soil. And in an ideal world where we have our native plants in our native soil, in their native watershed, there, there's nothing really to do. For the vast majority of us, that's not gonna be the case. Many of us live in urban areas that have been developed or redeveloped for or decades, if not more than a century. And so we're not in our native soils. We may not know what happened to our this soil beforehand. It may be compacted. We may suspect that they used chemicals. The most important thing you can do is, to start off is to figure out what your soil type is. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do that. One is to figure out if you have, um, you know, to do something like a ribbon test or a jar test. There are a lot of things on the internet for how to do it, but basically get, you know, some damp version of your soil and kind of squish it and get a real feel and really understand how much clay you have, how much silt you have, is it sandy? because there is a type of plant that likes every type of soil that you have. Um, so figuring out what your soil type is makes a huge difference and it makes it a lot easier to have a successful garden. You can also um, do soil testing. You can send them out to labs and ask for soil testing. Um, some labs will even with request give you what amendments you should use it and you can request organic amendments and tell them you're doing native plants things like that working with your soil to figure out what it is and what it looks like is really important since many of us are not in native soils we are often in places where we have compacted soils where we have soils that have been challenged i had soils one time that had been under um plastic sheeting and two inches of rock for about 40 years. It takes a long time to work with those soils. And really what you wanna do is to feed your soils. You wanna give them everything they can to go from being dirt to come back and be a living system again. You wanna make sure that they're getting all the nutrients, all the things that they need to grow back into those systems. Um, there are some good classes on it and there's some really good topics. And with each of these, we'll send you out some resources as well. Um, if you have compacted soil, here's the thing. You can feed the soil and help the soil, 
tearing up the compaction doesn't uncompact the soil. So compost, 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 as somebody says in the in the um, chat, feed the soil, give it everything it needs, give it things that will um, that will root through it, give it lovely cover crops that will grow across it, give it earthworms. Um, and so figure out what your soil is. Understand that you're not going to change your soil type and that you need to work with the soil type that you have. It, it's a really beautiful thing to get to know what really does well in that soil and kind of develop a relationship with it. And are there specific diseases or pests that affect California native plants? Um, there are diseases and there are pests that impact all kinds of different plants. Um, in, what you wanna look at is for your particular plant, your IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Um, you know, most potential pro pest and disease problems in plants or particularly native plants are caused by over and underwatering. Um, they don't have enough air around them. They're not the right selection for that area. So they're not getting quite what they need. So understanding the, the plant and what it needs out of that space makes a big difference in giving it what it needs and keeping it healthy and safe. So when you have something, if you start seeing it's getting a little punky, it's getting a little wilty, it's getting a little something that, that doesn't look right, um, check your soil. Check to see if it's too watered. It, a lot of people overwater their plants to begin with. Um, make sure it's not too dry, all the things you would check for. And then monitor and track how it how it's working throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout that season. Um, also, if you have things where you're starting to see and you can't see something specific, monitor and track your plant. See if it's if that is spreading, if that's changing. Um, make sure that you know whatever's happening to it, if it's not something that should be happening to it, isn't changing radically. Um, but look also at the things that should be happening. If you have um, if you have little bug chews through your leaves, the little bug chews are normal. You're creating habitat, um, and you want them to. Uh, you want them to be able to to chew on your plants a little bit. That's part of what you're hoping for and part of what you're you're doing. Um, but if you are having problems, and you can go ahead and search, you know, whatever your plant is, get your type of Ceanothus, ask if it, you know, and search IPM. Um, you often will find answers to those. Uh, going ahead and looking at, at, you know, what type of leaf curl you're seeing on your plant or what type of buzz you're seeing, or is it being chewed? That often helps quite a bit. So they're learning your, your plant and, and being able to to search for the answer is actually pretty easy. And um, there's some really great resources out there and we'll include some of them. Um, and the next one, uh, how can you tell when a native plant is ready to be repotted or replanted? And this has started coming up quite a bit uh, lately. I've had a couple of people ask um, if they should or could move their native plants. And like all good answers, it depends. Um, how established is it? Is it doing well? Are you willing to, is it doing so poorly that moving it is just kind of giving it a shot if you're moving something that's established? Um, but if you're getting ready, if and you know, potted native plants do beautifully. Um, for people who don't have as much outdoor growing space, they're a terrific option. And they're a great way for so many of us to enjoy them. But at what point are we ready to re to repot them? Uh, if they have visibly overgrown roots, what you don't want is for, for anything to start getting, you know, circling roots and become have its roots become its own pot. So before it gets to that point, you want to, you know, if it's you want to repot it, you want to repot it if you're starting to get the roots hanging down from it and they're becoming a problem in their own way, if they're trying to dig their way into, into the soils around it and to grow, um, it's not gonna go well between the pot and the, and the soils under it. 
if the plant is starting to look stunted, it's getting yellow leaves, the growth has slowed, it's kind of not doing well, it, it's at the edge of its, its space. Um, if you have kind of dry or shrinking soil, like if your soil doesn't look good in your plant, in your pot, that may not even mean that you need to go to a bigger pot, but you may need to be adding soil or to reconsider planting it in a way that it has a better soil for that setup. So there, you're sometimes repotting to go to a bigger pot. Sometimes you're repotting to get a healthier setup for what that plant needs. Um, and sheet mulching. If you're thinking of taking out your landscape or if you're thinking about taking out a section of landscape and thinking about weed barriers and all the things that go down, really look at sheet mulching. Sheet mulching is a way to take out your grass that is um, that feeds your soil. And it is the healthiest way to do it. It doesn't put things into the green waste or into the waste cycle in the same way. It actually should keep things out of the waste cycle and it gives you a healthy, healthier spot to start growing your landscape. And so what is sheet mulching? Sheet mulching is a lasagna recipe of, um, of cardboard, of water, uh, compost, and topped with mulch, or like a layer cake version, or however you want to think of it. It, it, it. Like most lasagna recipes, a lot of us have our own way of doing it. But what the basics are, you want to cut the current grasses or the growth down as much as possible. You want to edge any spaces that you're going to be using with a little divot. You want to roll out your, your cardboard over those space, over the landscape, and then kind of just roll it and tuck it into the divots that you created around the edges, like, you know, around your walkways or edges of driveways, things like that. You want to roll it in, into those areas so that it's good and tight up against the edges so you don't get that little hairline around the pieces. Um, with that cardboard, you want to wet the cardboard. Wetting the cardboard will help it to hold in place. And particularly if you're in a windy space or if you're doing a hillside, if you're looking to do some planting on a hillside, it's a really good way to anchor it. Um, wet your cardboard and have, help it stick to that space. And then you put in compost. You're feeding a soil that you know, hasn't needed or hasn't had its nat its um, original watershed or its original soil. You're feeding the soil that you're going to be growing into. And then you can do a couple layers like that with cardboard and compost, depending on what you're doing, on what space you have, on what you're trying to get rid of. If you're trying to get rid of something really difficult, if you're trying to get rid of ivies or creeping grasses or things that are really going to frustrate you, Put a couple extra layers, um, wet the cardboard each time, and then you want to top it with your mulch. Um, preferably, if you're looking at the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance, I believe it's three inches that's, that's suggested. So sheet mulching is a way to change out your landscape. It's a good way to feed your soil, and it's a good way if you're planting in an unusually shaped space to kind of help anchor that and take it out. If you have something that's difficult that keeps growing through, it's also something where you can go in and just kind of spot cover it. You, you keep a little bit of extra cardboard around. I would like to say none of us have extra cardboard around, but the reality is a lot of us probably do. And just kind of put it back over there, put some more, some more mulch on top of that and spot do it over and over until it's gone. Um, I got rid of some creeping ivy from, doing it that way. And it took a couple of rounds. It took being a little bit more tenacious than the plant. And so far I'm winning as of today, if I don't speak too loudly and let the plant hear me say that at least. So huge fan of sheet mulching. There are some great resources online for it. It's a way to use up cardboard that you have, or you can get B-roll that is big rolls of cardboard out there as well. Are there vines that can tolerate clay soil? So this one's kind of a specific, but one of the things that we get a lot and that are in the Q and A's and the chats and everything 
are we get a lot of questions that are really specific. I live at 89th and 45th on a northwest corner, and my I have clay soil and I need I need vines, I need shrubs, things like that. I'm gonna pop out of this screen for just a minute and do something that some of you are gonna know. I've seen going through the chat, a few of you know how to do this already, but not everyone does. And we're gonna take just a minute because it's the answer to a lot of your questions. This is calscape.org. CNPS is currently in process of investing in and really working on Calscape to make it an even more usable, useful, attractive space to find plants, to find out about plants. We're gonna go through this version, the advanced search up here on the right. If you go into there, let's say you want something in, I'm gonna choose Redlands, California, because my family has been there for generations. And I want annuals, I want perennials, I want um, grasses, and I need a tree. I want, in that area, I've probably got full or at least partial full sun or partial sun. And not going to worry about drainage, not knowing that, but what, low to extremely low water requirements. Ease of care, if I'm being honest, because I talk and think about native plants all day and my landscape is not currently as up to speed as it could be. So we're going to go very easy and moderately easy use of care. And I wanted to do all the happy things, but I'm going to put in bees and birds and butterflies, but I want you to look at this and also note that there are things here for bank stabilization. We have things that are deer resistant. We have ground covers. Um, in some of the pieces up here with slow moving soils, you can put in and have it be that it's clay-like. Um, I'm gonna put in, I want it to be commonly available in nurseries. And then you can create a list. So you can get a list that is that gives you things that should do should hit all of those. These are all ones local to that area native. They meet all those requirements. And then it is doing this is a starter list. It's it's figuring out what really works. But I want to give you an idea on some of these. I'm going to choose the iconic poppy because it's so beautiful and so easy. But let's say you're in a really strange area to find a plant you're going to be able to come in really close and say you're in, a, you know, you're on a tiny little peripheral edge. You can see if that plant you've chosen really is native to your area. You know, Thousand Oaks here that's got some spots that are and that aren't, and you can scroll in and see if it's truly native to your area. So we get a lot of these questions on how do I find the right plant or the right tree, the right replacement shrub, and this gives you that opportunity. You can take a look at it in all this, these different photos. The updated photos are gonna have a lot more gar in garden pictures, but you can also go to nurseries that carry that plant and find your favorite nursery or your new favorite nursery if you don't have one yet and see if they have them. You can you know, come into the nursery, figure out where they are, go to their website, take a look at their lists. So that was more of an example. And I'm gonna go back to our slide deck now. So there are, there are plants that can tolerate most everything. It's really using your filter to try and start that search to figure out where you are and what works for where, for where you are. And as a side note to the where you are part, a lot of us are experiencing a heat wave today. It has been a strange year where there have been cyclones and tornadoes and odd storms. So a lot of us are thinking about what we should be planting. And there's a lot of controversy around this. Um, native plants are still the most likely to adapt. And you don't know exactly how your area is going to change. So pre-guessing when you don't know might not help you. It, that's my, one of my big concerns. I live near the coast, although it probably will get hotter at times. I'm probably also gonna get more moisture. So I'm gonna stick with the plants that are coming and adapting to my region, as opposed to trying to pre-guess and choose something from a fair amount south of me that may not be adapting as quickly as I would need in that area. Um, I know we get that question a lot and it's in the Q and A's and it's in the chat this time. So I wanted to make sure to address that part. 
Um, what native plants are safe to use near water and sewer pipes to take a look at this? Um, there's some great radio lab episodes about this and about plants trying to get to water. And it's fascinating if you want to go down that, that, that rabbit hole and be, it's one of my nerd things. So it's great to see. We also have our guest host here, Leo in the picture. Leo is kind of our, uh, our mascot, our spokes, spokes dog, our model for our photos here. Um, but native plants, you know, if pipes are concerned, if you're in a, an area where you know you have underground lines, where you've had problems in the past, what you want to do is both have regular maintenance and you're, so you're having your shadow out on the landscape a lot. So you can take a look at these plants and you can really keep an eye on if something is happening and you're seeing any leaks, any things like that. Um, it's important to keep your eye on any potential problems but also try some that are known for having non-invasive root systems. Uh, we have things that are really, that are, are better for this than others. Uh, the California poppy that we just looked at is a good one. And it's uh, such a beautiful example right here. California fuchsia, um, the Matia poppy, uh, beach evening primrose, uh, coast sunflowers, uh, Channel Island tree mallow, so look for things that have a non-invasive root system. Uh, they might be the, the best option if this is something that you had an, an issue with in the past. And there are a lot of resources available. Uh, if you've been to these talks before, and you'll see it if you haven't, you'll get an email after this that will send you a list of resources. There are also people near you who are into native plants, who are willing to talk native plants. And I've seen some of that happening in the chat. A lot of people who are willing to give advice and to help people out and have direction. And there's so much good knowledge in these groups. It, it's amazing. I, I am often humbled by things that I didn't know or didn't know enough about and what I learned from the people that that attend these and that are parts of our chapters. Um, the CMPS chapters, I believe we have 36 statewide that have over 10,000 people in them and they're all doing different things. Um, Master Gardeners are also a terrific resource. And if you have a local nursery around you, getting to know your local nursery is an amazing resource. Uh, nurseries are a great way to really get to know the plants that do well right around there and to grow a relationship. And if you don't have a local nursery near you, you should. Um, so maybe you need to start one. So I'm gonna turn this off in just a moment and let Maya and I take the last couple of minutes and answer some questions and have some of these discussions. We do this every month. It is always the first Thursday. Well, one time it was not. Outside of that, it's always the first Thursday from 5.30 to 6.30. Next month, we're going to talk about plant propagation. So we didn't go into that a lot, and I know there were a couple of questions about it. Uh, but every month, we try to get into a different topic, dive a little bit deeper, and learn a little bit more. So I am going to stop sharing, and you get me and Maya full time. All right. Yeah, we had a lot of questions come through. Um, There's a lot of questions and a lot of uh, and a lot of good discussion. Yeah. Um, yes. Do you want to take the first stab on improving soil and severe slope? Just seeing. Well, if you have a severe slope and you're having soil issues, it that's a broad question. It depends on what you're improving. Um, trying to if if you want to improve the soil. Do something like the sheet mulching. Depends on how severe the slope is. Make sure you can get some cover grasses or something going that will help hold it together. Um, try and get something into that space to take care of it. it it's a vague enough question that it, it's hard to, to answer it as fully as I'd like to, um, but that's a, that's a start. Um, okay, next question. Um, best way to find your soil type? 
that's a good question that we can reference like later on too. We have a lot of different resources for that. Um, but the best for, in my opinion, is just like a ribbon test, but you just have to do it in different, um, multiple parts of your garden. Um, so that's, you take some, um, you take a little bit of soil in your hand and you spray a little bit of water and you follow this. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure with the, um, with the soil. Like if it feels gritty, then go to this question. And if it feels sandy, go to this question. Um, but I will put that in the follow-up resources. So I'd say ribbon test is the, probably the easiest, less like time intensive way to test your soil, but just really being sure to test multiple parts of your, uh, multiple parts of your garden. So, yeah. Yeah. If you have a landscape that's larger, that's been redone over time, you're going to have, you're very likely going to find more types than you anticipate. Um, um, let's see. First thought on pretty native vines that can live in pots. I don't know. That's... Maya's had some really pretty potted plants. That's why I'm asking. I've never tried any vines. I've had like manzanitas that do well in pots, lupin. Uh, what else? Different annuals, like just seeding out native plants um, in pots have done really well. Uh, yerba buena is going crazy in my backyard in a pot. It's like totally taking over. Um the I can also link um in like a follow up some resources on container gardening with native plants. Um, I, I see people adding some in the chat. Yeah, too. yeah. Uh, um, and it depends on you know where you're at and if it's in the sun and yeah, you know, there's a bunch of different things. Um, let's see, how much should they would you amend soil with compost for native plants? Um, and the answer, like so many, is it depends. Um, yeah, it it depends on what you're doing. If na if native plants are in good soil, if they're in their native soil, if you have soil that's doing really well, they don't really need that as much. If it's been, you know, if you're in downtown San Francisco and your yard has been done and redone for a hundred years, give it, keep giving it compost until it seems happy. Give it compost, give it compost tea until things start to grow regularly. If, if you know, if it's been under two inches of rock, it's going to take you reapplying it until, um, until the plants come back. So most of the time you're not putting a lot in, you're just putting enough to kind of feed the soil and let the, so let the plants take up the nutrients from that soil. Great response. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, okay, help. Can you help me with how much I should trim back my artemisia? They're very leggy and overwhelming. My encelia and buckwheat. They're all first year natives. I'm not sure which artemisia you're talking about, but my artemisia douglasiana, my mugwort, is just growing like it grows like a weed. I mean, it just takes over, and I'm very. I just cut it back all the time and just, just let it dry and use it in teas and stuff. Um, so I think, like I said, there's no hard and fast rule. Like you don't have to wait until after its first year to prune a plant. If it's really taking over and overwhelming a space, just be mindful to, you know, not prune back more than 20%, um, of the live plant. Um, I think you're totally, totally good to, prune I mean sometimes they really like having that refreshed prune so um and you can always like just do a quick google search on the plant and then like if it's like let's say Artemisia californica pruning you can find you know certain resources about the timing and different ways to prune because um certain plants have you know specific timing that makes the most sense but totally go for it and if you're near a college with a horticulture program, they may have a pruning club. Um, like, uh, let's see, Merritt College in Oakland has a pruning club. There's there's a bunch of places that'll answer questions. And like most things, your chapter has, your CMPS chapter 
often has really knowledgeable people. They have people who can answer all kinds of questions. Um, let's see, my we have a question in the chat part on did you, you know, did you say to leave the top one inch of the plant above ground when planting it? And can you just kind of explain what that means just a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I can honestly just like, po I posted the YouTube video. It's kind of hard to explain uh, with words, but you just want to make sure that the, uh, like you don't want the plant to be like sunken in the hole. You want it to be like above the ground. You don't want the roots exposed or anything, but um, you want it to just be like even just half an inch above so that um, it's not like uh, the plant's not like sitting in a hole. And then when you irrigate it, it just like sinks in and then the roots get all just rotting and that's not what you want. So you want a little bit above the grade. Um, but I will, yeah, I hope that answers it just like a little bit above. Um, and I put in the chat, the, I mean, it's hard cause this chat is just 500 messages at this point, but, um, I will put it in the email follow-up the, the video and it, it very clearly shows, you know, how to plant the plant and, relative to the to the grade and everything yeah um, you don't want it to kind of as the soil starts to resettle kind of droop in fall in a little bit you want to give it a little space above that yeah yeah so and it's okay I mean obviously when you're planting it and then you're irrigating it'll drop into the soil and that's totally fine so you know you want to count add a little bit um two inches above is totally great because it'll account for the sinking that will naturally occur. Um, Falcos are great pruning pruners, by the way. They're, mm -hmm. they're great. Um, yeah. Well, it's okay. exciting to see so many people on here having these good discussions and rec making recommendations for plants, for nurseries, for resources. Um, is that are the chats usually available when we send out the link to the video, Maya? Um, I will go through the chat and glean all the resources. I'll make a a good document for for everybody. So it might take a few days, um, but we'll definitely have this recording up and a follow up email to all the people that registered with all the resources that we talked about and all the resources that all of you talked about. It's great. I'm, I'm really excited to read the chat, honestly, because you all have so much knowledge. So it's great to, to hear from all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the things it's, it's nice to be in a place where everyone is so kind and helpful and thoughtful of each other throughout the entire discussion. And I think so. you all can maybe save the chat. I don't know. So I can towards the bottom there's there's like a smiley face on the bottom right um by the chat you, there's these three dots you say more and then you can say um save chat so i think you right. all maybe can but if not i have it saved so i'll go through so no worries um um i don't know is there a way to, for me to do it yeah we can't oh, see their versions so it's a little bit tougher too Mm, um, I think because we're the ones with the recording. Yeah. So um, we'll we'll make sure that the the relevant pieces and any others that come up, we'll try and collect and get out to you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We will along. definitely save the chat and you'll all get it. I know right now it doesn't seem like you all have it, but um, oh wait, I guess can I? I want to be able to figure this out now because everyone's wanting me to do it. Um, so, next month, talking propagation. Um, the ability to to grow your you know, your own plants from scratch, kind of, um, and propagation is something we think a lot about. We need more people propagating, being able to grow plants for themselves, for their neighbors, for nurseries, for all of it. So, if we want native plants to be more available, um, we want more people growing them. So, we're excited about next month's talk, and. Yeah. You'll get an email in a few days that will have links to a bunch of resources. It'll have a link to the recording. And in our CMPS YouTube, we uh, we keep all of these recordings there so you can always go back and reference them as needed. Mm -hmm. All right. Any last thoughts, Maya? 
I couldn't figure out the chat, but don't worry, it'll be saved and we'll we'll send it to we'll I'll get all the good all the good things out from the chat and be sure to capture all of it. So yeah, thank you. All right. Appreciate y'all. Have a good night. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye.